Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, if I could ask everyone if you could to mute your microphone if you're on a speakerphone or on a headset, it will help us with background noise. Appreciate that. Um, good afternoon or I guess morning for many of you. Um, we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, as I said, uh, this is Paula Barnes. And on behalf of the ALA Board of Directors and our Executive Director, Oliver Yandel, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, we really appreciate each of you taking the time out of your busy Friday um, to learn more about our proposed amendments to the association's bylaws and the benefits we believe this will bring to our members and our association as a whole. Uh, before we get into the meat of today's presentation, I'd like to get, take a few minutes um, to introduce to introduce those that you'll be hearing from today and to run through our agenda and then to give you some instructions on the Q&A session that we will conduct at the end of today's webinar. Um, today, this afternoon, you'll be hearing from uh, me for a few minutes and then from Executive Director Oliver Yandel, um, President-elect elect, and Chair of our Membership Model Task Force, Laura Brumell, and then also from President-elect Teresa Walker, immediate past President Paul Farnsworth, and our Senior Manager of Membership, Tina Austin. We, um, we anticipate the presentation part of today's webinar to take about 20, 25 minutes. And then, as I said, we'll conclude with a Q&A session. If you have questions during the webinar, you can submit your questions by typing, into the, typing them into the chat section down in the lower right-hand part of your screen. However, we would ask um, if you would hold off on your questions until toward the end of the presentation, we may answer some of your questions um, during our part of, of today's webinar, and it will help us not have to wade through quite so many questions toward the end. If we're not able, we'll, we're going to attempt to get through as many questions as we can in our allotted time today. But if we're not able to get to your question before our time runs out, we will follow up with you with an answer via email. In addition, today's webinar is being recorded, and at the end of our time together, uh, I'll give you more instructions on how to access uh, that recording. There will be two opportunities for you to do that. Okay, um, once again, I want to thank you for your time today, and I'm now going to ask our Executive Director, Oliver Yandel, to provide a bit of background and context for today's discussion. Oliver? Thanks a lot, Paula. Um, as all of you know, ALA adopted a new strategic plan a few years ago with a vision of becoming the undisputed leader in the business of law and doing that by delivering cutting edge management and leadership products and services to the legal community and by identifying and providing solutions to the most critical strategic and operational challenges that you guys face. Um, the business of law, as you guys are very familiar, has changed dramatically, especially in the last seven years. And the role you play in your law firms and law department success has grown and become increasingly complex. Um, as your membership organization, it's essential that ALA provide thought leadership, insight, and analysis to help you and your management teams achieve success. And that success comes through the collective leadership of many players. Um, it's driven by law firm and law department CEOs and executive directors, but you also rely on a vast array of resources, managing partners, functional specialists, support staff, practice managers, your fellow administrators through ALA, and consultants to understand and address the many challenges and opportunities that your firms and law departments face. As we work to implement the strategic plan, we're examining every aspect of the organization for ways we can realize that vision, and these bylaw amendments are part of that strategy. And to give you more context and information on that, I'll turn it over to Laura Brumell, the chair of our Membership Models Task Force, for more detail. Laura? Thank you, Oliver. And it looks like we have about 105 people on today, so that's great. Um, thank you all for joining us for this discussion. Early last year, Paula formed a board task force to review various membership options. Joining me on the task force are Linda Quint, Karen Glowacki, Mark Bridgman, and most importantly, Tina Austin from ALA headquarters. Our ALA membership model has been a focus of discussion for years, and it really was one of the key elements of our 2013 strategic plan. To be the undisputed leader in the business of law, we need to be forward thinking and we need to be a professional association that embraces change. 
just as we need to embrace the changes that are impacting all of us in our firms today. The Membership Models Task Force recommended two changes to the ALA bylaws. The first one involves student membership. Our bylaws currently allow students to join ALA as associate members at a significantly reduced cost. We are clarifying the criteria for student membership. Our current bylaws are too restrictive, allowing only students in business, management, law, or law-related studies. We believe student membership should be open to any degree program at an accredited institution. For example, many of us have liberal arts degrees. We want to be more inclusive. Our current bylaws allow full-time exempt employees to be eligible for student membership. We would like to limit student membership to non-exempt employees. We don't want to offer a $25 membership to those who are eligible for regular membership. Our current bylaws do not allow part-time students to join with a student membership. We would like to include part-time students. As many of you know, there's a Master of Science program in legal administration um, in Denver, and all of those students are part-time. We would like these students to be able to join ALA. Our current bylaws do not limit the number of years someone can be a student membership. We feel a limit of four years is appropriate. The second change to our, by to our bylaws relates to adding consultants as members. As we continue to work on our strategic plan, we realize that we are not allowing a core part of our legal community to be members in ALA. The board has unanim unanimously approved adding consultants as regular members of the association. We view these consultants as providing expertise in their fields, and we can all benefit from their active membership in ALA. A few examples of consultants are one, someone who works as an administrator or functional specialist for a number of different firms on a part-time basis. Another example would be an outsourced professional who would qualify for membership if she or he were paid by your firm. In this example, assume your records manager is paid by, let's say, IST. That records manager could be a member, but Hal Blackman or Kim Oleniak would not be member eligible. Another example is someone who provides intellectual property to individuals or law firms and corporate law departments. This would apply to consultants such as Kristen Stark, Rob Millard, Steve Wingert, or Tim Corcoran. We have heard from a handful of members regarding the proposed changes to these amendments. Several members have really been excited about these proposed changes, and a few have raised understandable concerns. Some of our members did not know that students can already be members of our association. We believe the changes we are recommending are appropriate. We would like to engage our potential members early on. If they get hooked on ALA while they are students, they will be eager to join as regular members when they are gainfully employed as legal administrators or functional specialists. Change is difficult. When I first joined ALA in the mid-1980s, I was an office manager for a small firm. At that time, I was welcomed openly by my chapter members. That firm dissolved, and I moved to a different firm as the HR manager. Some of the same members who had previously welcomed me no longer talked to me. They were still of the belief that ALA membership could only be for principal administrators and not functional specialists. Most of us don't even remember the time when ALA, ALA was that exclusive. Our knowledge, resources, and networking would be severely limited if we could not sit at the same table with our managers and directors in the areas of HR, finance, technology, pricing, legal project management, and others. Change is difficult, but change is good. Adding consultants as members opens up access to a higher level, level of expertise and knowledge. Other professional associations include consultants and even business partners. The Legal Marketing Association opens up membership to both consultants and, and, and business partners. And just take a, look at the, take a look at the names who have been inducted into the College of Law Practice Management. Ward Bauer, Verna Myers, Ross Fishman, Mary Beth Pratt, John Remsen, Jr., 
Susan Lambreth, Joel Rose, Sally Schmidt. Those names are as familiar to us as other college fellows. Mike Palmer, Rita Ally, Patty Groff, Dick Niggan, Bill Migdron, Teresa Walker, Judy Anderson, Paul Morton. That's just to name a few. We do recognize that these consultants sell their services, but they do not sell insurance, logo products, staffing solutions, or cloud computing. And they would need to sign a non-solicitation agreement. These folks are all professionals. They recognize it's all about building relationships, not selling. Another concern we heard was regarding opening up membership to employees of business partners. The concern raised was about not being able to share information about business partners as freely as we currently are able to do. That may be true, at least initially. ALA members had the same hesitation 30 years ago when functional specialists were invited to join. Administrators did not think they could talk about firm challenges and strategy with those who report to them. Now we all know how important it is to make sure everyone we work with has a seat at the table. Personally, if I have an issue with a business partner, I would talk to that business partner and I would definitely not put that on a listserv for all to see. I don't think that's fair to any business partner. And I am pretty certain that some information that is shared with our ALA co colleagues is already making its way to business partners. Several times when I have a post, when I've posted an inquiry about a project I'm working on, I get a call from a business partner who happened to hear about my project. They heard about it from an ALA member. We do understand the concern and fear. We are just hopeful that most problems can be avoided by open communication and trust. As, as mentioned earlier, the board unanimously approved the proposed bylaw revisions and it was an enthusiastic unanimous vote. We have been studying this issue for quite some time and we strongly believe that the inclusion of consultants as members will add a critical resource needed to achieve our strategic goals. Change is difficult, but change is necessary. We ask for your support for these amendments to our bylaws. Thank you again and now I'm gonna turn it back over to Oliver for questions. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, if anyone would like to submit questions in the chat section, uh, again, on the lower right-hand corner of your screen, um, we'll, uh, we'll take those and, and provide you with some responses. So feel free to go ahead and, and enter those. If you have any, any trouble, um, if you can let us know that too. We'll see if we can help you out. But so far, there are none. Anyone? Bueller? Ferris? <laughs> okay, now we've got a few questions that are coming through. Um, the first one is, is it possible to approve part of the bylaws but not all? For example, approve consultants but not BP, uh, business partner employees. Uh, Laura, did you want to take that one? Uh, well, I'll try to. I, I'm not sure how it's coming out from ALA headquarters. I'm not sure if the thought is that it would be um, option one, option two, option three. The way I understand is the proposed bylaws will be sent out and the chapter presidents will vote on them as a whole. So it is certainly our, our hope that all of the chapter presidents will vote yes on the proposed bylaw revisions as, um, as sent out. 
That's correct. There will be two uh, bylaw amendment questions, one having to do with student membership and the second having to do with uh, the consultant membership. Um, but the, the amendments are proposed um, as, they're, as they're written, so it'll be an up or down vote based on the language presented um, with each of those amendments. There'll be separate votes for students and consultants, but um, the, the language of the amendment would be what, what would be either approved or, or not approved. Uh, the next question is, how do we distinguish between business partners not allowed to join versus outsourced law firm employees employed by business partners? Um, Laura? So how do we distinguish between business partners? Um... Not allowed to join versus outsourced law firm employees employed by business partners. So the way we would look at it is that if, like in the example that I used earlier, is that if we have a records manager that is an outsourced employee, uh, my firm would have the right to um, sign that person up as an ALA member. Um, but someone who works at that outside outsourced company um, at their headquarters would not be member eligible. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Um, Tina might be able to answer that a little bit more effectively. Hold on one second. Um. This is Tina Austin. Um, it, it's not uncommon for membership staff to request a job description. Uh, that's what we do now whenever there is a question about membership eligibility. And that is what we would continue to do to determine if that particular employee were eligible for membership. Does that answer the question, I hope? And I think uh, Teresa had a, uh, a comment she wanted to make. Teresa? Yeah, I just wanted to add for everyone, uh, as we think about the consultants in particular, there are a number of high profile names in the legal industry who serve as legal consultants. And I think our ability to include those folks as members is a great benefit to our membership as a whole, especially to people, our members in smaller firms, who may not routinely have access to some of the folks like Ward Bauer or Don Aiken or Joel Rose or Peter Zorg Hauser, uh, any number of consultants who many of the large firms look to day in and day out for the things that are going on in their business. but. Folks in smaller firms may not have access to those folks many times, and I think allowing them to become members in the association would make them more readily available on a um, more routine basis where they're not having to pay for the cost of uh, networking with the consultants per se. So I just wanted to add that as another topic to consider. Thanks, Oliver. Turn it back to you. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, we've received another question. Uh, are you concerned about a decrease in membership about the change with regard to business partners? I ask this because any, everyone's first allegiance is to the person who writes their paycheck. Uh, anyone want to chime in on that one? This Teresa, I'm, I'm happy to do so, and if I'm understanding the, cor the question correctly, it's coming from the perspective of business partners who would not be allowed to join. And um, I think one of the things that we discussed is um, that the, the we thought that the allegiance really from other business partners could possibly be strengthened through this and that we believe that there are certain consultants in our industry whom, if they were members of the association, would actually help raise our profile um, uh, in the industry, particularly with regard to ABA members and uh, members from other legal organizations. So if we have, the, have folks such as um, Joel Rose or Ward Bauer or Tom Clay, um, 
among us, there was some thought that it does raise the profile for the group. So um, as far as a decrease in membership, if, the, if it's from the perspective of if we allow business partners to join as, men, or excuse me, consultants to join as members, will members be turned off and then not renew their membership? Um, I think there may be some initial reactions along that vein, but really I think when anyone thinks about it for a very long period of time, the value of the organization to them far outweighs any concern that they may have over sitting next to a consultant at a, mem at a uh, chapter meeting, for instance. So I don't think we have really seen that as being a concern um, that would be created by this change. And I, I got some clarification on the question, Teresa. Um, it, it was really focused on situations not not pure consultants, if you will, but uh, the employees of business partners who could be eligible for membership. I think it may have been uh, the outsourced folks, um, the, the example that, that Laura gave in, in her presentation. So the outsourced folks, such as the records manager with exactly. IST, for instance. And I think um, it kind of goes back to the thought of these folks are really acting as functional specialists. And in most of our firms, the folks who are outsourced, such as in my firm, we have a facilities management group that is outsourced here. Frankly, I think about them more as Waller employees, as employees of our law firm, as opposed to employees of the outsourced company, as far as the day-to-day -day interaction. Um, and I think it's really just seeing them really as functional specialists uh, and the benefits that they can provide just as people who are our own employees, whether they be HR functional specialist or IT functional specialist or accounting functional specialist, just as those folks bring members, or excuse me, bring knowledge and uh, resources to our group, we believe these folks would do the same thing. Uh, assuming outsourced law firm employees may join, does it matter who pays the ALA dues, the firm, or the business partner? Um, I, I don't know that it would. Um, do any of you have any different perspective on that? This is Laura. I would assume not, and I could. I would assume that. If someone has an outsourced professional who would be member eligible if they were paying for them themselves, the firm could offer to pay for the manager or director or the outsourced company could offer to pay for the membership. So I could see that it could come from either, either one. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, uh, the the slides and the recording of, of this webinar will be made available. We'll talk about that um, before we wrap up, but uh, you will have a chance to take a look at this um, again if you'd like to review or share with with others. Uh, the, another question is, would the ALA consider breaking out the amendment so that members could vote on each of the issues separately? For an exam for example, an amendment regarding consultants, business partner employees, uh, or free uh, IP. Um, Paula, Laura. I'm not. Sh this is Paula. I, I'm. I'm not sure what. Um, what the third one is. Um, would we consider breaking out the amendments? Uh, we have not talked about that, but um, I'm sure that we can talk about that. It would depend on the board vote and what the board decided as a whole. Um, another question, if we're going to ask the consultants to sign a non-solicitation non agreement, is it fair to ask them to then be available to consult uh, with or for their co-members? Thank you. 
Teresa, any reaction? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just rereading the question here to be sure I understood it. Um, So is it fair to ask them to be able to consult? And, and I don't think that is the intent um, at all of being able to consult. Our real intent here is that the consultants would basically become a part of the network that we work with day in and day out. Um, and just as we might pick up the phone and call uh, one of the our fellow chapter members, once we had developed a relationship with someone like Ed Wiesman, for instance, who is another consultant who also is a former um, ALA member and also large firm administrator, um, I think we would feel much more comfortable picking up the phone and calling someone like that. So I really don't see it as a consulting role that we're asking them to take on in the membership, but really more of um, being one that brings their knowledge and their experience. I think it's a great opportunity for us because consultants work with so many different law firms across the country and even internationally, and they are aware of all the trends that are developing in the industry long before we have any sort of exposure in our law firm, and we also only see things from the perspective of our law firms. So we feel like the consultants really bring a very diverse and special and unique experience and wealth of knowledge to the association through membership. Now, certainly one of the things that we have not done in uh, exploring this opportunity and, and in making this amendment suggestion is to go out and poll all of the consultants to the legal industry. We, we have not done that to say, hey, if we make available membership in ALA, will you sign up? We certainly expect that some of them will, but, but we are not in any way suggesting that all the legal consultants in the industry are going to sign up to become members. But we do think it's a great positive. It is a great uh, access to some of the best knowledge of trends and skills and expertise that there is in the industry, and in part because they do work with so many diverse firms, we just think that the consultants have a ton to offer to our members and feel like that to the degree we can um, encourage some of them to join us will be all that much better for them. There are a lot of trends today, such as legal project management is the one that comes to my mind where the industry is really struggling to understand what that is and how we go about doing it and how we implement it in our law firms. And one of the top consultants in that arena is Susan Lambreth. She has traveled not only across the U.S., but also internationally training on this. And I think by opening um, membership up to Susan, if she were to join, that it provides a great wealth of knowledge for us and also allows us to be more of the leaders in the changes coming at the industry um, by having our members be uh, recognized as, as leading uh, trend changers and uh, developing educational programs, writing books, articles, speaking at the ABA, wherever it may be, um, I think it really helps raise that profile and provides great access uh, to our members. I'm sorry, folks. We had a couple of other uh, questions in the Q&A section that I did not see, but I'm there now. Uh, one of the questions was, what happens to the outsourced records manager membership when he or she joins another provider? Um, Tina, did you want to respond to that one? So the, the question is, what happens when the outsourced records manager, in Laura's example, um, what happens to that membership when they join another provider? Tina might be on mute. Tina's muted. I, 
I think she's coming over to my my receiver. Is it back on? No. I can hear you because you're sitting across from me. But... Yeah. Oh, one. She's on her way. Oh, I am. This is Tina Austin. Uh, the way the membership currently works is it follows the individual. And I think the reason the individual joins ALA is so that they can take advantage of the knowledge and networking and resources we offer. And so it makes sense to me that the membership would then follow the individual from firm to firm. And I think that their employer would be investing in that membership to enhance that employee's development. That's my take on it. And I welcome any other questions. Tina, this is Paula. Um, I would clarify that to say that if they go to another provider and they are no longer eligible for membership as the membership criteria states, then they would not be able to be a, a member, correct? Right, that's right. Um, another question uh, that came through is, uh, if BPs are joining the ALA, will there be new educational, well, it, and this is, um, we're, we're not asking for, um, for BPs to, uh, to become members, um, but the, I guess rephrasing it, if consultants are joining the ALA, will there be new educational sessions pertaining to them? Um, and I think the answer would be we'd want to make sure we were providing service to all of our members, but more likely than not, the consultants would continue to provide the, the educational and intellectual uh, capital to, and contrib make contributions to the organization in that fashion. Uh, another question is... Questions about when the vote is scheduled. Um, the schedule for the vote is. Hold on one second. Tina, do you need to schedule the bylaws? I believe it's on the website. We'll um, we'll send that information to give you the details. There's a uh, there's a um, a notice period for the chapter presidents followed by a um, period for the chapters to actually, uh, chapter presidents to actually cast their ballot, but we'll make sure that all of that information is included with the, um, the follow-up to this. Uh, April, April 3rd is the deadline for the, for the vote. Um, so uh, that'll be the day that the voting on the amendments close. Um, there was a, another question about, So uh, here's a, here's one question: Is it is it fair to ask the uh, the consultants to sign a non solicitation agreement, and then for me as a member, as a very small firm administrator, to call Ward or Brad or Joel, et cetera, and ask them for input on an issue I'm I'm facing, and get their expertise without hiring them as a consultant? This is Laura. I can take that one. Um, I think the non-solicitation agreement is going to be for, for chapter meetings and um, listservs and things like that. So if we have a, um, Tim Corcoran, if he, if he, and he wouldn't, but if he joined the Minnesota chapter, he was just here for um, our educational conference last week, so he's on my mind. So if Tim joined the Minnesota chapter and he came to regular monthly meetings, he because he signed a non-solicitation agreement, he wouldn't go to those meetings and try to sell his consulting services. Or if there was a, a listserv question posted, he would not be, he would, he should not reply to that and say, oh, I can take care of that. But it's all about building relationships. So if I get to know Tim better during meetings and I understand what services he can provide, I'm going to build a relationship with him and I'm going to be, um, he's going to be top on my list when I hire a consultant to come into my firm to teach us about legal project 
project management and pricing. So it's, it's not that they can't sell their services to us as members, they just can't come to, they just can't go to a chapter meeting and sell during the meeting. Oliver, and, this is <clears throat> Teresa. Can I add something on that one? Sure. Um, I, I think we can think about that one a little bit as our lawyers have to uh, conduct themselves in dealing with clients. It's a, a somewhat similar in that our lawyers are ethically bound, if you will, not to solicit clients directly. But um, so I, I kind of think of it in a similar manner and uh, don't think that the consultants would would treat it any differently, nor should we as professionals treat it any differently. And, and it's really not, oh, no, I, I was ahead, also going to say that it's not unlike, um, some of our firms have specialties like employment law, for example, and they're members of ALA and members of our chapters. and. We might say during a meeting that we have an employment law issue, and they might come to us afterwards and say, "Well, I, we, our firm could help you with that." But um, you know, so some of that already happens amongst members. And this is a little bit of a related uh, question. Although the non-solicitation agreement will be included, what policing will be done? Um, any of you want to comment on that particular question? I think we self-police, that's what I think. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this is, is done uh, in the same way uh, regarding business partners. When, when there are issues or concerns that are raised with business partners who are engaging in, in behavior that seems to be you know, outside the, the appropriate uh, parameters, um, we, we certainly, certainly here at headquarters and I think our member leadership uh, gets that feedback as well. Um, so there is a lot of self-policing that already goes on in that context, and I'd imagine the same would be true in this instance. I think we've covered most of the uh, broad questions that have been submitted in both the Q&A section and in the chat section, but uh, we still have a few more minutes, so if other folks have questions or comments they want to make, please send them along. Oliver, this is Teresa. There was a question from um, someone here that asked, were any large firm administrators involved in the discussion regarding these amendments, administrators from firms of 200 or more? My firm's right at that number, um, not quite 200, but yes, and certainly there's been discussion among the large firm administrators after the notice of the amendment um, has gone out. And um, so, yes, we, we've discussed it, and I think it is with so many different things. Um, there are a number of various opinions about uh, what works and what works well, and um, we've tried to take into account as many of those um, opinions as possible as the board has explored this issue and think we've done uh, a good job of identifying what the key issues are, but certainly part of our reason for having this webinar is to learn of anything that we may have overlooked. Okay, we got a few more. Uh, will the membership still belong to the individual consultants, students, employees out of, source, of outsourced firms? And if yes, how do you manage eligibility should that person leave the job that qualifies them for membership? And I think we've we addressed that um, previously, that uh, the, the membership status would depend on their eligibility for, uh, for membership within ALA. Tina, did you want to add? Yes, indeed. We we currently do that now with our membership. Our members change jobs all the time. They go from being administrators to being consultants to leaving the industry. And we anticipate we would continue to do that as we do that now. We, we hear about a member who's changed jobs or a member advises us that they've changed jobs. And if there's any question as to eligibility, we reach out, we ask for a job description and make a determination. 
So I don't see that that would change at all going forward. We've gotten a couple of questions uh, regarding um, the, the clarity um, among the, the distinction between consultants and business partners and uh, outsourced uh, professionals and those kinds of issues. Um, so what we can do is take that feedback and work on the language to make sure we can provide a little bit more clarity and direction as to um, what those distinctions are um, to see if that might help. Oliver, this is Teresa. I have a couple of questions that have been sent through to me because they were not seeing, um, they did not think their questions were, were getting through, those, so they sent them to me privately. One of them is, won't this change the face of the organization when these high-profile consultants start running for office? I think um, the best way to look at that right now is to look at the example that's provided by the LMA, for instance, uh, the Legal Marketing Association. Tim Corcoran is one of the very high profile consultants that's in our market these days, and Tim is the current president of LMA. I don't think that it has changed the face of the organization other than to raise it, uh, at least in my mind, uh, when I realize that people are involved in it that really have knowledge and expertise within uh, areas that I'm, I'm very interested in. So I think to the degree it changes the face of the organization, it will be a positive change, uh, especially one that's maybe more highly regarded in the legal industry as a whole. And then an additional question is, is there concern that allowing consultants to join could reduce the potential to gain them as business partners for local chapters? And again, I may not be the best person to answer this question per se, but um, we don't really see that as an issue at this point. Uh, it's somewhat like, our attorneys joining our local bar associations and they also join the American Bar Association. So we really have not considered that it would uh, be a huge impediment. And if anything, um, again, I think it's probably a plus for the local chapters to have someone of that magnitude. If, for instance, Tom Clay lived in my area, which is in Region 2, and attended our meetings, I would think that would be a great draw, and especially for some of the large firm administrators uh, in particular. So I think it could be a very much a positive from um, that perspective. And um, my guess is what other organizations have seen is that once potential business partners understand the value of the organization, they're more likely to do both, both become a member of the organization if possible and support it more so. And I think Linda Quint, one of our directors, has some personal experience uh, of this nature with the firm where she is located out in San Diego, and that's exactly what has happened in her case, and she shared that story with us a number of times. Linda's on the line, but I don't know if she's able to provide those details, but her law firm is a business partner and provides legal services to an association, and they are actually a member of the association, and they have become that because they realize that um, being a member was great, but also being a business partner and being more supportive was even a better plus for their law firm. And this is Oliver. Um, my experience in other associations has been the same. Uh, where there has been the opportunity for consultants to participate as members, uh, their commitment and investment in the association, both in terms of their financial contributions as well as their uh, intellectual contributions has increased significantly. So um, that generally has not been a trend that most associations that have done this have seen. This is Paula, if I could interject just real quick. I want to be sure that we are not um, confusing with terminology. We are not proposing that business partners 
be members. What we're proposing is consultants and individual employees of business partners who serve in a more consultant type role. I just want to make sure that we don't confuse anyone. There was also a question about uh, would we be able to limit access um, to consultants on things like listservs um, that administrators might use to ask each other questions. And I, I think I can I can take that one. Um, we provide those kinds of, of um, special interest groups, if you will, uh, throughout the organization. The large firm administrator administrators have one. Um, our corporate uh, uh, administrators have one. And it's easy to create those opportunities for those kinds of more uh, private engagements for a limited section of the of the membership. So. Um, there are ways to provide those kinds of, of environments and those communication platforms um, and still allow them to participate fully as members. Oliver, Oliver there's a couple of questions here that um, I thought I might, I might try to answer um, that sure. I think are, are similar in nature but a little bit different. Um, there's a question, if an outsourced provider's employee goes to a conference, does the business partner still need to have a booth? And the answer to that is if they want to be there, yes, they do. Um, again, the membership is part of the employees. It's an employee membership, not a business partner membership. So if the business partner wants to um, sell and solicit and um, have more employees there than just maybe the one who is a member, they would, yes, need to have a booth. I don't think I've misspoken there. Um, and then the second one I wanted to address, um, the question is, shouldn't members be getting industry trend information from business partners in the normal course of events? How will that improve if the business partners are ALA members? Will non-member consultants and business partners be ignored? And, and personally, I, I wanted to answer this because, yes, we should be getting industry trend information from our business partners as well. Um, how will it improve if the business partners are ALA members? Uh, again, the business partner as a whole is not the member. It's the consultant's employee that is working in the law firm that is the member. So uh, there's a little difference there. Um, and will non-member consultants and business partners be ignored? And my answer there would be no. If, if uh, take the example that a lot of other people have used, Tim Corcoran, if Tim Corcoran or someone like Steve Winger decided not to join ALA, um, I would not ignore them. They still have expertise, and I would still want to want to tap into that expertise. Um, I would hope that they would be interested in joining ALA, but if they chose not to, um, not going to ignore them just because they are not members of ALA. We okay, had a question. We had a question asking for some more examples of providing intellectual property to law firms. There was a reference to the names of some uh, some of the uh, consultants that might be familiar to, to some folks, but others on the on the call uh, may not be as familiar to them. So, Laura, do you want to take that one? So, I, I think any anyone who sells their services. Um, would be considered a to, to law firms or legal departments would be considered a, a legal consultant, and I recognize that Tim the Tim Corcoran's of the world or Kristen Starks um, are not that familiar to everyone, but it would be the Altman Wiles of the world, the um, the um, Edge consultants like Ed Weisman. Uh, there are so many different consultants that are out there, um, but they. They help us with everything that we do in our law firms, as Teresa mentioned, the legal project management and the pricing. Um, those are all things that most of us are struggling with right now. And if we could in open up membership to have consultants be at the table and we're talking about our struggles and they can participate and say, well, this is what I did and, or this is what, um, this is what um, I know other firms are doing, I think that would be very valuable. Uh, an example is that Last summer I went to an LMA P3 conference, which is the Pricing and Legal Project Management Conference in Chicago, and um, they allow consultants and business partners as, as members. 
I, during the roundtable discussions, which they had several of them, I received more information and more clarity on the things that I need to do in my firm from some of those consultants and business partners rather than the LMA members that were also in attendance. So I think we just need to, it's similar to the fear 30 years ago that I mentioned before where we didn't want our, our HR people as part of ALA or we didn't want our finance people because we didn't think that we could talk openly about whatever was going on in our firm. And, and now we've all changed the way we view um, those those co-workers and those co-managers and co-directors that we work with and they need the they need ALA and we need them in ALA. I think this is just expanding our breadth of knowledge and I'm really excited about it and I know I will be a better administrator if I have more if I have more friends who are consultants in ALA. Going through and Checking to see if we've hit most of the questions. If any of my co-panelists have seen anything that we haven't uh, touched on. A couple of questions related to um, the incentive for consultants to, to join as members versus um, perhaps being a sponsor of the organization. And again, I think what we've seen both with other legal organizations as well as other associations in general, that that, that tends not to be the case. In fact, it's, it's the opposite. The investment and the support is enhanced because of their, of their engagement of the organization as a member. Um, I see one question. I don't think we addressed it. The question is, so any outsourced employee working in a law firm can be an ALA member, right? Um, I would say no, that's not that's not correct. Uh, we, we have two outsourced employees in our facilities management um, here at my firm, and I don't see either one of them as being member eligible. So no, we're not saying any outsourced employee can be, would be ALA member eligible. If they, if they were working for my firm and they were ALA eligible, and we're not paying them because they're outsourced, then they would be member eligible. So I, I, we recognize all of this is very confusing. Um, we've been studying this for, for nearly a year and um, we'd love to make it more clear, but we really appreciate everybody's questions and I know that there'll be more to come and we, we, we want that. We are coming up on uh, two o'clock, uh, Paula, any... Um... We are. I was. I was waiting for one more thing. I believe someone sent a couple of questions just to host, and so we haven't been able to see those. So I was asking Aaron to forward those to us so that we could try to uh, try to go ahead and answer those if possible before we get off the call. If not, we can take care of answering those directly. Um, but I think they went to a different list than what we've been seeing. Um, so I uh, will wait just a moment. In the meantime, um, let me go ahead and, and give you some information um, about the recordings. Um, the, everyone who registered for today's webinar will, will receive a link to review the recording of today's webinar. And you can forward that link so that you can share it with others in your chapter or in your region to access the recording. What you need to remember is the first name, last name, and email address that people will need to enter in order to view the recording is the person who registered. So you'll need to make sure that you provide that information to anyone that you forward the link on to. And then also the webinar will be available for viewing on the ALA website by the end of next week. So if you want to view it on the website, uh, there's another opportunity for you to be able to do that. Um, I have not received those questions yet, but the person who sent the questions to host, I will make sure that we answer those questions and get those back to you. We'll also go back through the um, Q&A and make sure that we answered all the questions. Um, and if we did not, we'll get back with you. You are welcome to contact any of us. If you have additional questions, I know that we would all be very happy to talk with you. 
Um, I had a real good conversation the other night with the president of the Capitol chapter, and I am happy to talk to anyone as well as I know that uh, Laura, Paul, Teresa, Oliver, Tina, um, we are all available to answer any questions. We want to make sure that everyone understands and everyone um, gets the questions answered um, so that you can um, be fully informed when you talk with your chapter president about their vote. Um, I would like to say thank you to everyone for participating. We're just slightly over our hour, but um, I know again that this is a busy time for folks and we appreciate your time. And again, please don't hesitate. Thank you, thank you again for attending the webinar and uh, we look forward to continuing to make ALA the best and the leader in the business of law. So thank you very much.